Well, hey, you have came on a great day. We have a guest speaker here today. He and his wife are the team chaplains for the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, he told me that you could be a fan of any football team as long as it wasn't the Steelers. No, no Steeler fans in here. Because uh, I feel the same way about the Patriots. And I, I see Nick Morris is wearing his Patriots jersey. Eesh, I always give him a hard time. But hey, uh, we are honored to have Lamoris Crawford here. Um, if you were here first service and you stayed second service, praise the Lord. Come on, it is that good that you could hear it twice. But why don't y'all do me a favor? Why don't y'all stand up and give Lamoris a big River City welcome? What's up, River City Church? You may be seated. It's an honor to be here with you this morning. Um, I have one agenda, and that's to provoke you. And so I'm going to do my part to provoke you to righteousness. Um, I love your pastor. He's a good, good man. I, I haven't got to know, uh, in black churches, we say the first lady, Jesse, uh, but uh, I know you guys are spoiled. I know that much. Um, and so he called me this morning. He wanted me to let you know that he loves you. And so he does love you. Pray for your pastors. If you want to have a negative opinion, just go to another church. But if you're going to attend here, pray for your pastors. They need it. You have no idea what they face every day. Uh, but I'm excited about getting to know him and honored that he will share his pulpit with me. And so I hope you're ready. Um, I didn't come here to impress you. What you think about me, I don't care. My wife loves me. <laughs> but I'm here to preach the truth in love um, because I believe what God is preparing the body for uh, on the things to come, uh, we got to get ready. And so I pray that this message helps strengthen you and challenge you. And so I'm going to preach my guts out because that's what I, I do. Nothing half-hearted. I do everything full throttle. Come on, somebody. Um, and so... It's amazing. When we sin, we go all in. When it comes to the kingdom, we want to be, come on, we want to let the gas off the pedal. It should be the opposite. Come on, somebody. All right, whatever. Y'all tripping. I'll preach myself happy. Don't make me done. Uh, let's pray. I always pray before I preach, and then we'll go from there. Father, thank you so much uh, for being in your house. What an honor it is to stand before your people. Holy Spirit, I invite you in this place. You will not be grieved. You will not be offended. I give you complete reign and authority. Holy Spirit, I ask you to articulate the Father's heart through my voice to your people. I pray that every ear is open, every heart is open, every mind is open to receive that which you have for us. So I ask you to invade this space. It is not by might. It is not by power. But it is by your spirit. And so I humble myself under your mighty hand. Not my will, but your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So I am originally from Chicago. Born and bred. Shout, shout out, stand up. Huh? Uh, born and bred all my life. My grandmother raised nine kids, which she had by five different baby fathers. So my grandma was a single mom, raised nine kids on welfare in the projects on the south side of Chicago. And so when I was 10 months old, my mother was murdered at the age of 17. And so my mom had my brother at 14, had me at 16, and she was shot in the head at 17. I've never met my father, don't know who he is. My family don't know who he is. Uh, my aunt was in a domestic violent relationship. Her boyfriend murdered her at 28. I had another uncle that was in a gang. He was murdered, shot in the head at 17. And I had another aunt that died at 15 from a brain tumor from asbestos in the projects. So my grandmother raised nine babies. Four died. She raised nine grandbabies on welfare in the projects. And so I grew up with a huge question mark on top of my head of who am I, why am I here? I did not understand why life happened to me the way in which it did. So I completely rebelled. My grandma did the best she could with what she had. Come on. And my grandma had one rule in her house, and it was this. I don't care what you do between 8 and 3.30, just don't come home. <laughs> you raised nine, 18 kids. Come on, school hours was vacation. 
And so nobody in my family tree went to college. Nobody in my family finished high school, actually, at that time. And so I wasn't made to go to school. But there was two reasons why I went to school. Number one, I got a free meal. I was on a hot lunch plan. Come on, somebody. I knew if I didn't go to school that day, I wouldn't eat. Because there were times I would come home and I'm hustling, eating syrup sandwiches, sugar sandwiches, literally trying to survive. Powdered milk. It's disgusting. I knew if I went to school that day, I would at least get a meal. The second reason why I went to school is I love gym class. Come on, somebody. Not P.E. I went to gym class. Old school red dodgeball print to the face. Come on, somebody, gym class. Today they got these Tickle Me Elmo dodgeballs. You get hit today, you laugh. <laughs> no, dodgeball day was fight day. Come on. I love gym, and I picked up a basketball, and it was literally an escape of reality for me. It didn't matter the pain I was going through, the loneliness, the abandonment issues. When I was on the court, you couldn't hold me. It didn't matter that I was the dirty kid on the block, the kid with holes in my shoes. When I was on the court, you couldn't hold me. So basketball became a huge part of my life. My desk sat next to the teachers. Literally, every year of grade, elementary, middle school, my desk sat next to the teachers. I was a kid that was suspended. I was a kid that was in trouble. I was in a gang by 11, and I was selling crack cocaine by the age of 14. I repeated everything I saw before me. I was drinking early, smoking early. I was exposed to things that an eight, nine-year-old should have never been exposed to. I barely graduated the eighth grade by a complete miracle. My, if it wasn't for my grandma, how many of y'all thank God for your grandma? Come on, somebody. I thank God for my grandma. And my grandma had an attribute. My grandma was a hustler. <laughs> like, for real. My grandma was a hustler, B. You got to be a hustler. You raise 18 kids. Come on, somebody. But they didn't want to graduate me because I didn't do any work. I would literally come home, throw my books down, and be outside 10, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. There was no structure in my home. There was no father's voice in my home. And so they didn't want to graduate me. My grandmother met with the school board, and they cut a deal. My grandma was such, listen, my grandma was such a hustler. My grandmother died at 72 years old never having a driver's license. My grandma bum rides off people or we took the bus everywhere. My grandma was such a hustler, she would bum a ride off of you and you would pay her gas money. <laughs> My grandma met with the school board and they got her to cut a deal. Two things happened. She had to attend all of my graduation practices in order for me to walk across the stage. And they said, if you can pass the Illinois State Constitution test, we'll graduate you. You needed a 76 to pass. You needed a 75 to pass, I scored a 76. Come on, somebody. And they graduated me to eighth grade. I made it to high school by a miracle. My high school was 2,500 kids. My freshman year, I was five foot four inches, maybe 100 pounds, and I made the basketball team. I was a four-year starter in high school, and I was the man. No, for real, I was the man. I was that dude, right? Turnabout king, homecoming court, prom court, voted most athletic out of my class. I was the mo most popular kid in my high school, but nobody told me at the end of popularity was nothing. It was a joke. Like, for real, all my high school kids in here, let me just give you 30 seconds. Man, don't be searching and seeking out popularity. It's a joke. You better know who you are, and you better start laughing at peer pressure. But you better learn how to laugh at people. I tell my son all the time, boy, your swag's so deep, you'll make a submarine sink. Don't let another person's opinion of you become your reality. You better know who you are. Peer pressure. People try and peer pressure you to smoke a drink, have sex. Man, you better start laughing at people. <laughs> Come on, they'll leave you alone. You better start acting crazy. Come on, somebody. Anyway, let me move on. I'm tired of young people giving their identity away. Come on, that's your sacred space. Don't get that to nobody. Don't let no dude convince you to do what's opposite of your convictions. You ain't got to try and be like nobody else. When you try and be like somebody else, you lose your value. And I don't know about you, I know I'm valuable. And I know I'm cool. You got to know you cool. I'm the coolest person you ever meet. I don't need your opinion to validate that. I know I'm cool. 
You about to know you cool? I'm cool. Just look in the mirror and be like, man, I'm cool. You should have a saying, I'm cooler than the fan. No, matter of fact, I'm cooler than the air conditioning. Come on, somebody. All right, man, let me move on. Y'all tripping already. So I'm the man in high school. I'm thinking if I could sleep around, get high, drink. I was the clique that all of, we threw all the parties. Everybody wanted to hung with us. But at nighttime, I would lay in my bed with this thought in my mind. If this is what life is about, I'm going to be bored. Because I did it all. If this one I'm supposed to look forward to, getting lit all the time, not being fulfilled, the more I did those things, the void in my heart got bigger, I didn't understand it. Because if I was to drink, I thought if you drunk, that'll take your problems away, right? You go through some of your friends, all right, let's just go get towed up. As soon as you come out being torn up, ain't nothing changed. Me getting drunk didn't solve nothing. Me getting high didn't solve nothing at all. So now I'm 18 years old, no vision for my life, no purpose for my life. I was being recruited to go play, but I ended up scoring a 14 on my ACT. How many of you think you can go to college with a 14 ACT? Raise your hand. You better not raise your hand. <laughs> you chilling with me at the community college. Ain't nothing wrong with the community college. I'm just saying that wasn't my plan. Why? If you don't put in the work, you don't get the success. Nobody told me what I'm about to tell you. So, man, all the schools that were looking at me turned their back on me. I ended up going to a community college. I played one year of basketball there. And when I was 19 years old, I had an encounter that rocked my life. My first cousin was the leader of a gang in our neighborhood. He had nearly 300 kids under his authority. They carried dope for him. They carried guns for him. Whatever he told them to do, they did. He meets this girl one night, walks her home. Her dad locks him in the living room and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. And he gave his life to Christ on the spot. We met back up a few years later at 19 years old. <laughs> Set me down, told me the gospel of Jesus Christ. I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. From that decision, I finished at that community college with an associate's degree, transferred, got my bachelor's and master's degree. I'm the first ever in my family to attend and go to college. <laughs> Come on. And now my wife and I so, serve full-time as a team chaplain to the Cincinnati Bengals. How does a nappy-headed kid from the projects end up serving some of the most influential people on the planet? It wasn't religion. It was a person. See, salvation isn't an event. Salvation is a person. And the question is, do you know him? See, religion is man's attempt to reconcile themselves to God. You can't reconcile yourself to God. You got to lean into the one who has reconciled us. Amen. So some of y'all thinking, what does that story have to do with me? We from Orange, where, where am I? Am I safe? <laughs> I was driving down here like me. I'm glad it ain't 1812. Brother would have been in trouble. <laughs> when did tenant windows get invented? So I need them suckers. Listen, I could crack any white joke I want. My wife's white. Come on, somebody. <laughs> what does this story have to do with me? We from Orangeboro. How do you even pronounce this place? Talk to me. Orangeboro. Orangeboro. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm from the projects. Help a brother out. You know why racism sucks? Let me tell you why racism sucks. Number one, we can't invite each other into our experiences. When was the last time you had somebody that didn't look like you eat dinner at your table? We are the church. There is no law that's going to change racism. Stop depending on the government. The 1964 Civil Rights Bill didn't change a thing. Oh, my gosh. I better get to my sermon because it just got thick in this room. <laughs> didn't change nothing. Because the law can't change the heart of a man. Only grace can do that. You have grace in your mouth. Our job is to go tell the story. 
Men's hearts need to be born again. And you got the story. Ain't no law can do that. It don't matter who's the president. Why are you tweeting and putting on Facebooks about opinion of somebody who's in D.C. when you have never invited your neighbor to church? The kingdom of God isn't political. When you get to heaven, he ain't going to say, well done, my good and faithful Republican. <laughs> well done, my good and faithful Democrat. No. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Who has you served? We'll serve a party before we serve the king. We'll, we'll tie ourselves to a political party before we say we're a Christian. That's a problem. Oh, what do you think you came to church to hear? I'm just curious. <laughs> Come on, we got to do better. Amen. I believe revival is going to hit America the moment the church stands up. And do you know Paul said God has given us, the church, the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. If racial reconciliation is going to happen, it's going to be through us. Amen. You can't be a Christian and be racist. Don't even utter his name if you hate people don't look like you. Don't utter his name. You misrepresenting. That's what, actually, that's what in the Torah, when the Bible says don't use the Lord's God's name in vain, it's not a curse word. That's not what he's talking about. When God delivered them out and he began to weave them through all these people they had to destroy, God was saying, listen, if you're going to rock my name, if you're going to say you serve Jehovah, you better live it. Because if you say I'm your God and you don't live it, you're using my name in vain. So if you're a Christian or believer in this room and you racist or have a problem with brown people, my Latino brothers and sisters, come on somebody, you need to get your heart right. We're the front runners. Come on. Just go have a conversation with somebody. We don't have a right to have preconceived ideas of people. How fair is that? What if Jesus had a preconceived idea of you? Could you imagine? If he saw you in your sin, there's no hope for you. Thank God he sees us through the blood. That's our only hope. About to get to my message, man. <laughs> Looking at me like I'm crazy. I don't even know who that was for, but I pray you received it. Amen. I had this kid in high school. This is funny. So I grew up in a very racist home. Uh, we white people was the devil. That's what I was taught. And uh my sophomore year of high school, I had a kid on my basketball team now named Kyle Davilar. You know he was white, Davilar, right? <laughs> and I took a bus to school. So I went to school in the suburbs. I took a bus every morning to school because my grandma wanted us to go to school. My high school was 75% white. Unlike John, he went to a you know, more darker high school. Come on, somebody. And so this kid named Kyle um, invited me over for dinner, right? So y'all know my struggle growing up was real. Get a free meal, I'm already there. I don't care what color you are. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you offer the brother a free meal, I'm there. I don't care how I got to get there. So he's like, man, Lamorce, I would love for you to come over for dinner. I'm like, man, Kyle, absolutely. I got you, bro. And so after school, he took me to his house, which is less than a mile from the school. He literally lived on the same road as our school. So we get into, about to pull in this driveway, and it's a church. I'm like, oh, snap. Now, I wasn't raised in church. But you get a preconceived idea of church. I'm like, dang, he's taking me to church. This brother did lie. <laughs> ain't know nothing about a parsonage. Come on. <laughs> ain't know he was a pastor's kid. Ain't know his dad was a pastor. So we pull in the church and we go right past the church. I'm like, woohoo, thank you, Lord. <laughs> we go to the back of the property and he, that's his house. His dad was a pastor. That was a parsonage. We walk in the house. I felt the peace of God. Now, I couldn't, disc I couldn't tell you in words what it was at the time, but looking back, I felt the peace of God. I walked in. I sit down at the table. His mom, dad, his two sisters. His mom, dad, and two sisters sit down at the table, and I start tearing up. 
because I didn't have a mom or dad that would sit down at a table and have dinner. I didn't know what that looked like. I don't even, I didn't even know why I was tearing up. It was the presence of God. In their home, it was present. And I felt it. I couldn't even describe it. This white family in black invite this nappy head project kid to their table. He didn't preach at me. He didn't tell me I was going to hell. He didn't, he just, they just loved me. They grabbed hands and prayed. I'd never seen that in my life. And something in me said, I want this. That was my son. He, I inboxed him on Facebook a few years ago and told him that story, reminded him and said, Kyle, you don't know how much of a seed that was for what I'm doing today. Why? He was willing to be the church. He was willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus. He was willing not to be like everybody else. I challenge you to invite somebody to your table. I'm about to develop a message called to invite them to the table. Someone who don't look like you, invite them to the table. Right, let me get to my message with my nine minutes and 23 seconds. <laughs> I want to preach to you a message this morning entitled, So What Now? So what now? What do you do when you get to the end of you've been standing, you've been praying, you've been believing God for something, you don't have no breakthrough, and you feel like you don't know what to do next? What do you do when you've cried tears, when you've given sacrificially, when you've laid joy most? I mean, think of areas in your life when you feel like, man, God, what next? One way or the other, and I'll walk with him, we'll all come to this place. I believe Jesus came to this place in the garden. The scripture tells us he cried great drops of blood. He's given his life for three and a half years, prayed for people, loved people, raised the dead sacrificially. Now you're telling me I got to go to the cross? The first time we see Jesus struggle with this, but he broke through. Come on, not my will. I believe Abraham dealt with this as well. You know the story of our man Abram? God shows up to him and says, yo, Abram, I need you to leave your family and your country. Surprisingly, that brother left. At least he did something. How many things God spoke to us and we still in park? It ain't about doing what's right. It's about being obedient. We don't define what's right. We get to decide to obey. At least that brother left. Come on. He didn't know where he was going, but he left, Right? God gave him a promise, said, I'm going to give you a son. 75 years old. Come on, you're going to have a son. And Sarah laughed. You know what's funny about the story? God asked her, did she laugh? And she said, no. I can't. Yo, you should have a list of questions that you're going to ask people when you get to heaven. I'm going to be like, Sarah, why you laugh? I'm going to see Peter. I'm like, Peter, now, let me just get something straight. You walk with Jesus for three and a half years and you never saw him lie, right? He's going to say, yes, yes. Why do we always think people in heaven talk that way? Why do we think God be like, it is I, my son? I don't think God talk like that. God be like, what up? I'm like, Peter, you know you never seen God lie. He's going to be like, right, I never seen God lie. So I got one question. When Jesus said you're going to betray him, why you say he didn't? You wouldn't do that. You call Jesus a liar. Y'all think about this stuff? Come on. Here's Abraham, 75 years old. God said, I'm going to give you seed. It's been 24 years and he still don't have the promised seed. Now, he had a seed, but it wasn't a promise. Come on. Don't let your disobedience abort the mission. Come on, somebody. We figure why God isn't showing up in our life. We got to go back to the last instruction that was given to us. No, Abraham, that ain't the promised child. I got to see if he, 24 years, 99 years old, still no promise. Abraham, so what now? I've left my family. I've been traveling. What now? And we pick up the story. Y'all ready? Lord, have mercy. Five minutes. Genesis 17. If you got your Bible, Gen well, we got to get to our lunch. 
You don't realize how fast these restaurants fill up around, no. Gosh, if you can't have fun in church, what else? Come on, somebody. Have a sense of humor. Man. God invented it. We don't think God's funny. He's hilarious. I even got a Bible scripture. I could share that with you. But I ain't, because that, that clock ain't stopping. Genesis 17. Verse 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to God, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Here was God showed up to Abraham. Abraham is at the question of, so what now? And God shows up. So if you're at the space in your life where you're asking God, so what now? Number one, you got to get in his presence. You got to get in his presence. Look what, look what happens. The Bible says, then Abram fell on his face. If you read in Genesis 12, right here, to, to this chapter in Genesis 17, not one time do you see Abram on his face. Why? Your protocol to the king will determine how he responds to you. See, Abraham knew God, but he didn't know God. See, you know of Andy Dalton. I can FaceTime him right now. I know his kid's name. I know the security code to his front door. I know him. See, Abraham knew God, but he didn't know God. He didn't intimately know him. So when he changed his posture, God showed up. See, we come to church on Sunday morning and it just is what it is. Do you really posture yourself to receive from the king? Obama went to London. It was the first time the United States president went to visit the queen in a long time. They gave the number one powerful man on the planet in some people's eyes protocol. And it was this. One of them was this. When you approach the queen, do not extend your hand to her. Come on, you want to start World War VI? Come on, somebody, touch the queen. That sister could have tripped and fell. You better let her hit her face. You better not try and catch her. Come on, don't touch the queen. The other protocol piece was you don't speak unless the queen speaks first. They're giving protocol to a man, that, to a woman who's a queen. How much more do our king have protocol? Do you know that's protocol for our king? David gave us some instructions, very simply. I love this, Psalm 100. He said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. In the context of the scripture, David has given us a picture of the tabernacle. He starts at the gate. He said, if you're going to enter the gates to God, you got to be thankful. When was the last time you parked and thank God? You got breath in your lungs. When was that time you thank God you live in American soil? Your house might not be 8,000 square feet, but at least you got one foot on that sucker. Come on, somebody. You might not be driving a 2018 Lexus, but thank God you got four wheels. Come on, somebody. Shoes on your feet, clothes on your back, breath in your lungs. When was the last time you thanked him? Get into the presence of God or the holies of holies starts with thankfulness. He says you enter his gates by thanksgiving, but then you get to the courts through praise. We show up to church, 
The worship was fire. Worship was fire this morning. I look around and people are like this. Have you ever wondered why some people get touched in the service and some don't? Same worship, same spirit. Because God's a gentleman. God only goes places he's invited. You will come to church, won't give praises to the God who created you, but you will scream at a TV. How you missed that tackle? Why you overthrew him? Yelling at a TV, be used to being in the same asylum. Who talks to a TV? <laughs> TV can't talk back. We'll yell at a TV, but keep our mouths closed in the presence of a king and wonder why he's not showing up. So you get through the gates with thanksgiving. You get in the courts with praise. How many guys know there's another level to the temple? It's called the holies of holies. Now, David stopped. This is interesting. David stopped in a text with the holies of holies. Why? Because there's only one person that gives you access to the holies of holies. See, in the Old Testament, the high priest, right? Remember that? They would tie a rope to their brother's leg with a bell. He would go in there and give the sacrifice for the people for the, for the year. If that brother wasn't right, he would die. If they hear that bell stop ringing, they drag that dude out. Come on. He was the only one allowed in the holies of holies. That's not true for you and I. Jesus did something supernatural that gives you access back to the Father. See, Adam jacked us up. Do you know you were designed for intimacy with God? No, for real. Like, do you know in the beginning when God created man, it was for him to walk with us? There was never supposed to be a heaven where God dwelt and then on earth where we live. No, he wanted to dwell with us. All right, check it. If you look in Genesis, right, the scripture says that God made, God made, God made, God said, God made, God said, God made, God. When it got to man, the Bible says, and God formed. You know what that word formed means in the Hebrew? It literally means he stepped out of eternity two feet on the earth. And the Bible says he formed Adam. Now, I believe Adam was about 6'8", 270, the old LeBron. Come on, somebody. Remember the swole LeBron? Start losing all his weight. That boy looked like a crackhead. Come on, somebody. Remember the old LeBron? I believe Adam had an 82 pack. Come on. Broad shoulders, quadriceps out the wazoo. Come on. And I believe he had an afro. Just because it's easy to pack dirt. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so God stepped out of eternity, formed Adam, and that brother looked it good. How do we know that? Because everything God made was So that brother looked it good. But he was dead. Looked good on the outside, but dead on the inside. How many of that is us? Oh, we look good. We'll play the role. Well, my question is, are you really alive? Then the Bible says that God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. You know what that word breath in the Hebrew means? Come on. He breathed into him a piece of himself. And he became a living being. So when Adam opened his eyes, who was there? Like this. If I'm going to breathe in your nostrils, I'm in your space. Intimacy. We know God walked with Adam so much so that even in his sin, he was looking for that brother. God showed up to lunch in the garden. It's 12 on 1 and Adam late. That brother ain't never late. Adam didn't know what late tardiness was. That's sin. Oh, Y'all better stop being late to stuff. God looked at his watch. Yo, what out of man? This dude tripping. He ain't never late. And the Bible says that God went looking for Adam in his sin. You can't hide from God. The last thing you want to do is not show up on a Sunday morning when you've done something stupid Saturday night. Come on, somebody. Just show up. The greatest thing you could do for yourself is to show up. 
Because if you give Satan an inch of guilt, that brother take a mile. Get into the presence of some people who can love you. So God's idea of intimacy was walking with men. And Satan hated it. When we read the account of the deception, it wasn't about the fruit. Satan was not made in the image of God. You know what that word image means? He made man in his image. That word image means to take a photograph of. God took a selfie and made you. God been killing the selfie game way before this generation. You look like your daddy. Hey. <laughs> Satan was not made in the image of the father. You were, and he hated it. He hated your image, and he hated intimacy. It's the same today. When you have an attack on you from the enemy, it's all about your identity. If he can get your identity from you, he can get the intim intimacy of God from you. Because the last thing you want to do when you don't see yourself the way God sees you is be with him. So ladies, you got to stop looking in the mirror and believe what the world said about you. You should weigh this much. Your hair color should be this. Your fa no, wear what you got and flaunt it, girl. You got a little extra, extras, all right? Be you. Be you. You are made in God's image. Looking at magazines, comparing yourself. I watched the documentary. The magazines be lying, dog. They be airbrushing them chicks on there. I watched the documentary. I know what I'm talking about. And you look at it and compare yourself to the image of God. Everything he made was, you good. Be you. I didn't mean hurry up, man. So intimacy was God's idea. Satan couldn't stand it. He killed the intimacy. It wasn't about the tree. It wasn't about the fruit. It was about the intimacy, and it was about their identity. And it's the exact same thing today. If he can rob you of identity, he takes away intimacy. You got to get in his presence. Get with your dad. So here's Jesus. Right? So when Adam and Eve sinned, it separated intimacy with man. Y'all with me? Stay with me. Intimacy is gone. So God instituted some things just so he could be with us. God came and lived in the box. How you put the God of the universe in a box? Come on. The Bible says that God placed the stars in the sky with his finger and called them by name. Scientists can't even tell us how many stars there are. How you gonna put that God in the box? But he did it for you. But it wasn't enough. So a few thousand years go by. Jesus, God, Emmanuel, God with us, comes and walk on the earth. He had one agenda, and that was a reconciled intimacy back to his dad. So he gets on the cross, takes your sin, dies. And the Bible tells us this in Matthew 27, 51. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What did the veil represent? It was a separation that only the high priest can go into the holies of holies. What does this death signify for you and I? We don't need no other mediator. We don't need another advocate. The temple, come on, it's been open. The holies of holies is open for you. The curtain was 60 feet high, 30 feet in width, and 30 inches thick. And the Bible says it tore from top to bottom. Why top to bottom? Because it was bottom to top, then man could have did it. This was supernatural. What is Jesus doing for us here? He's giving us our intimacy back to the Father. Get in his presence. Then the writer of Hebrews tells us to come boldly to the throne. How can we come boldly? Because the curtain is open. Abraham, I don't know what you think you've been doing, but you better get in my presence. Come on. Your husband can't fulfill what you need. God's presence can. The, fake, the Facebook likes can't fulfill it. The retweets, the IG likes can't fulfill it. You better get in your dad's presence. He's waiting on you. It's quiet in this room. Preaching better than y'all saying Amen. Number two, you got to embrace the new you. Embrace the new you. Verse five, God said this, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Amen. You know what the word Abram means? Exalted father. 
So every time his name is called, they're calling him an exalted father. God is like, hold on, bro. I've, tol I've tolerated this long enough. There's only one exalted father. And it's me. He changed his name from the exalted father to a father of many nations. You know what he did? He put an H in his name. It's the same Hebrew letter that he gave Adam. It's the exact same letter. He breathed into Abraham his spirit. How many of y'all see the new trailer for uh, Lion King? Do we got any 90s people in this mob? That was my joint. Jason Weaver went to my high school, who sing all the parts. That was my joint. How many guys remember the Lion King when Ed and Hyenas was talking? It was like Mufasa. He was like, "Ooh, say it again." <laughs> remember that part? Mufasa. Ooh, say it again. <laughs> Look what God did to Abraham. He said, "Abraham, I'm tired of you walking in the old you. There's a new you." Every time Abraham heard his new name, it breathed faith in him to produce a seed. Faith comes by, what was he hearing? What was the word? You are a father of, come on somebody, 75, 24 years. Now the seed is in him. So every time they say Abraham, he was like, ooh, say it again. <laughs> father Abraham, ooh, say it again. Abraham, do we need to take, ooh, say it again. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. The seed was in him to produce Isaac. You are a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Stop allowing your yesterdays to influence your tomorrows. Walk in the newness. Of, you can play. If you dare play, I don't care. Walk in the newness of life. Walk in the new life that God has for you. Stop allowing the enemy to replay your yesterdays. Put that sucker on pause. You are a new creature in Christ. Greater is he that lives in you than you that's in the world. What's on your tongue? If I know your faith language, I can determine the outcome of your life. Speak those things that be not as though they were. You'll rehearse a movie line. You'll rehearse a song on the radio, but you won't speak God's word. That's how you renew your mind to the new you. So every time Abraham heard this new life, it produced something in him, the faith to get Sarah pregnant. Come on, somebody. See, there was no faith when he got Hagar pregnant. That was just sex. But to get his own wife pregnant took faith. That faith came by the word that God put in him, which he heard. What do you say to yourself? You got to learn how to override the inner conversations you have in your mind. You are not your thoughts. You are who God says you are. You can do what he says you can do. You can have what he says you can have. You can become what he destined you to become. But it doesn't matter if it's on the pages, if they don't jump out into your heart. Get the word in you. It's alive. I remember my first get saved, Project Kid, being black in America, 50% of a, I, you know what the high school dropout rate in Chicago was? 50%. Being a minority in America, nearly 70, almost 70% 70 of prisons. A young black man. 11% of us barely going to college. You know what I have to tell myself, pacing in my living room? Lamorce, greater is he that lives in you than you that's in the world. You are not a statistic. You are not where you come from. Why? Because greater is he that lives in you than you that's in the world. I've been crucified with Christ, Lamorce. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved you, Lamorce. Yeah, your dad wasn't there. Your mom wasn't there. But God loves you. It's true for you. He loves you. He's for you. He has a plan for your life. He has a destiny for your life. He has a call on your life. You got to embrace the new you. No longer shall you be called your past. 
I'm here speaking to your future right now. It is great. And last but not least, number three, the Bible says three times in two scriptures, I will. You got to believe that God will do it. You got to believe that God will do it. Three times in two verses, he said, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and I will establish my covenant. Three times. Our job is to believe that God will do his job. Come on, somebody. That's easy. Only thing God is asking you to do is trust that he would do what he said he would do. That's it. There's no pressure on that because he got to keep his word, not me. Listen, Abraham, I'm telling you, I'm going to do what I promised that I'm going to do. You just get in my presence, you recognize who you are in me, and I will do my part. I believe God is speaking, us, speaking to us that this morning. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, I'm, I'm, I, God is in a life-changing business. He's done it for 6,000 years. Come on, that's a good track record. You can trust that. He will do in every promise that's written in here, if you get a hold of it, will come to pass in your life. Why? Because he is a God that he cannot lie. The Bible tells us that it's impossible for God to lie. And let me finish with this scripture. This is our family scripture for my family. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do, or has he spoken and will he not make it come to pass? God can't lie. I told you, Abraham, I'm going to give you seed, and you're going to be a father to many nations. I promise you. And not only did God say it with his word, he did it in action. He got, remember, he lined up the pigeon. He lined up all the sacrifices. Come on, read your Bible. Right after this, he, he cut a real covenant with Abraham. Come on, we had a covenant cut for us 2,000 years ago on Calvary. He would never waver of that covenant. The question is, do you believe it? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this great church. I pray, Father, right now that they take this area by storm, that lives will be transformed because of the way they live. Yes, we're not exempt from going through problems. We're not exempt from going through hard times. But you promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us. So may we get the right posture to you, my King, by coming in your presence. May we choose to walk out our identity in Christ alone. And may we trust you with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Praise the Lord.